met with President Zelensky on September the 1st. That meeting was originally scheduled to be with the President of the United States, and all the planning had gone into it, and there's documentation for that, that there was a meeting happening between President Zelensky, which is actually the place and date that he asked for, to meet with President Trump. Except in the final moments of that, in the final days leading up to it, Hurricane Dorian approached the United States, and that meeting had to be called off with the President while he stayed here, and so the Vice President went in his stead. There was no quid pro quo in the meeting. That meeting that was requested actually occurred. It was interesting to note as well, when I researched the record of past aid dates to Ukraine for the past few years, I found out in 2019, the aid arrived in September. But it's interesting, in 2016 to 2018, the vast majority of military aid each of those years, 2016, 17, and 18, also went to Ukraine in September. While it's easy to create an intricate story on the hold of foreign aid, it's also clear that President Trump has held foreign aid from multiple countries over the last two years, including Afghanistan, Pakistan, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Lebanon, and others. There's no question that a president can withhold aid for a short period of time, but it has to be released by September the 30th, which it was to Ukraine on time. The hold did occur. There are messages back and forth to be able to hold, but it's entirely reasonable to have the hold, and it was such a short period of time, and the aid arrived at the same time it usually did each of the past three years, that the Minister of Defense for Ukraine actually stated that the hold was so short they didn't even know it. What's interesting about this is, this is stretched from not just an abuse of power, but also a quote-unquote obstruction of Congress. That's the second article of impeachment. The House argument was that the president didn't turn over every document and allow every witness without submitting everything to Congress immediately. They argued that if the president challenged any subpoena, he was stalling, he was acting guilty, and so it was grounds for impeachment. Remember how fast this all happened. The investigation started September the 24th. The official start of impeachment started October the 31st and ended on December the 18th with a partisan vote in the House for impeachment. If President Trump obstructed Congress because he didn't turn over documents with, uh, that didn't even have a legal subpoena within two months, then I would say President Obama was not impeached, but maybe he should have been, though I don't think he should have been. But if you argue in that same way, because President Obama did not honor legal subpoenas for three years on the Fast and Furious investigation when that happened. Three years he stalled out. But there was no consideration for impeaching President Obama because he shouldn't have been impeached. He was working through the court system as things moved. This is a serious issue that became even more serious when the House managers moved not just to say that this is obstruction of Congress if the president doesn't immediately submit, but they took this to a different level by saying the president should not have access to the courts at all. Literally stating, does the Constitution give the legislative branch the power to block the executive branch from the judicial branch? House managers said yes. They can rapidly move through a trial, then bring the case to the Senate and have it only partially investigated and then try to use the power of the Senate to block the executive branch from ever going to court to resolve any issue. That has not been done in the past, nor should it be. The president, like every other citizen of the United States, should have access to the courts. And it is not grounds for contempt of Congress to not to block the president from ever trying to go to court to resolve issues that need to be resolved. Every other president's had that right. This one should have had that right as well. This tale that President Trump thinks he's a king and he doesn't want to follow the law begs reality. Let me remind everyone of the Mueller investigation. 2,800 subpoenas that were done over two and a half years. 500 witnesses, including the president's, many of the president's inner circle, all of those were provided. None of those were blocked by the administration. And after two and a half years, the final conclusion was there was no conspiracy between the president's campaign and the Russians. The president did honor those subpoenas. The president's been very clear on multiple court cases that he did not like and did not agree with. He's been outspoken on those. 
but he's honored each court decision. It would be a terrible precedent for the Senate to remove a president from office because he didn't agree that Congress couldn't take away his rights in court like every other American. The difficulty in this process, as with every impeachment process, is separating out facts and the politics of it. There are facts in this case that we took a lot of time to go through. Each of us in this body sat for hour upon hour upon hour for two and a half weeks listening to testimony, going through the record. We all spent lots of time being able to read on our own through the facts and details. It was entirely reasonable to be able to do it. But we have to examine at the end of the day what's a fact-based issue that's been answered. Each of the key facts that were raised by the House all have answers. But what is a politics issue? To say in a, an election year, what is being presented by the House to say, what can we do to slow down this process and to try to give the president a bad name during the middle of an election time period? To separate those out, out those two is not a simple process. But to begin with the most basic element of, do the facts line up with the accusations made by the House? They do not. Are there plenty of accusations? Yes, there are. And my fear is in the days ahead, there'll be more and more accusations as we go. There have been for the last three years. But at this moment, in the facts of this time, in the partisan rancor in the House and into the Senate, I'm going to choose to acquit the President of the United States. This certainly does not rise to the level of removal from office and forbidding him to run for any other office. It certainly doesn't rise to that level. In the days ahead, as more facts come out, all of history will be able to see how this occurred and the details of what happens next. I look forward, actually, to that continuing to be able to come out so all can be known. With that, I go back. Senator Tom Mann. Mr. President, I'd like to share my remarks not only with my colleagues today, but also with those who will come after us. And I want to touch on four issues. The trial itself, the President's actions as outlined in Articles 1 and 2 of the Articles of Impeachment, and finally, and most importantly in my mind, the implications of our decision this week on the future of our government and our country. First, the trial. Weeks ago, I joined my colleagues in swearing an oath to do impartial justice. And since that time, I've done everything possible to fulfill that responsibility. Paid full attention, taken three legal pads worth of notes, reviewed press accounts, and had conversations with my colleagues and citizens in my home state of Maine. The one question I got most frequently back home was how we could proceed without calling relevant witnesses and securing the documents that would confirm or deny the charges against the president, which are at the heart of this matter. But for the first time in American history, we failed to do so. We robbed ourselves and the American people of a full record of this president's misuse of his office. This failure stains this institution, undermines tomorrow's verdict, and creates a precedent that will haunt those who come after us, and indeed will haunt the country. But now we're here, left to make this decision without the facts concealed by the White House, and left concealed by the votes of this body last Friday. This was not a trial in any real sense was instead an argument based upon a partial but still damning record. How much better it could have been had we had access to all the facts. Facts which will eventually come out too late to inform our decisions. As to the articles of themselves, I should begin by saying I have always been a conservative on the subject of impeachment. For the better part of the last three years, I have argued both publicly and privately against the idea. Impeachment should not be a tool to remove a president on the basis of policy disagreements. The president's lawyers are right when they argue that this would change our system of government and dangerously weaken any president. Dan Ringer. 
But this reluctance must give way if it requires my turning a blind eye to what happened last summer. The events of last summer were no policy disagreement. They were a deliberate series of acts whereby the president sought to use the power of his office in his own personal and political interest. Specifically by pressuring a government of a strategic partner, partner by the way, significantly dependent upon our moral and financial support. Pressuring that government to take action against one of the president's political rivals and thereby undermine the integrity of the coming American election. And this last point is important. In normal circumstances, the argument of the president's defenders that impeachment is not necessary because the election is less than a year away would be persuasive. I can understand that. But the president in this matter was attempting to undermine that very election. And he gives every indication that he will continue to do so. He has expressed no understanding that he did anything wrong, let alone anything resembling remorse. Impeachment is not a punishment. It's a prevention, and the only way, unfortunately, to keep an unrepentant president from repeating his wrongful actions is removal. And this president has made it plain that he will listen to nothing else. Article 1 charges a clear abuse of power in inviting foreign interference with the upcoming election. Inviting foreign interference with the upcoming election. The president tasked his personal attorney to work with a foreign head of state to induce an investigation or just the mere announcement of an investigation that could harm one of the president's top political rivals. And to compel the Ukrainians to do so, he unilaterally withheld nearly $400 million appropriated by Congress to help them fend off Russia's naked and relentless aggression. The president's backers claim that this was done in an effort to root out corruption. So why not use official channels? Why did he focus on no examples of corruption generally other than ones directly affecting his political fortunes? And why did he not make public the withholding of funds as the executive branch typically does when seeking to leverage federal monies for policy goals? No matter how many times the president claims his phone call with President Zelensky was not perfect. It simply wasn't. He clearly solicited foreign interference in our elections. He disregarded a congressionally passed law. He imperiled the security of a key American partner. He undermined our own national security. And he was, if he was simply pursuing our national interests rather than his own, why was his personal attorney Rudy Giuliani put in charge. Why was Rudy Giuliani mentioned in that phone call? Put bluntly, no matter the defense, and as a majority of the members of this body apparently now recognize, President Trump placed his own political interests above the national interests he has sworn to protect. And as I mentioned, he has shown no sign that he'll stop doing so when the next occasion arises, as it surely will. The implications of quitting the president on Article I are serious. This president will likely do it again. And future presidents will be, will be unbound from any restraints on the use of the world's most powerful political office for their own personal political gain. We are moving dangerously close to an elected monarch, the very thing the framers feared. Article 2 to me is even more serious in its long-term implications. Article 1 concerns an incident, an egregious misuse of power to be sure, but a specific set of actions in time. A scheme is probably the most appropriate description, which took place over the course of the past year. Article 2, however, which concerns the president's wholesale obstruction of the impeachment process itself, goes to the heart of Congress's congressionally, uh, constitutionally derived power 
to investigate wrongdoing by this or any future president. I do not arrive at this conclusion lightly. I take seriously the White House counsel's argument that there is a legitimate separation of power issue here, that executive privilege is real, although I have to note it was never actually asserted in this case, but that executive privilege is real and that there must be limits on Congress's ability to intrude upon the executive function. But in this case, despite counsel's questions about which authorizing resolution passed when, whether the House should have more vigorously pursued judicial remedies, the record is clear and is summarized in the White House letter to the House in early October that the President and his administration, quote, cannot participate in the impeachment process, cannot participate. To me, it is this ongoing blanket refusal to cooperate in any way, no witnesses, no documents, no evidence of any kind that undermines the assertion that a categorical refusal with over witness intimidation thrown in was based upon any legitimate, narrowly tailored legal or constitutional privilege. No prior president has ever taken such a position. And the argument that this blanket obstruction should be tested in court is severely undercut by the administration's recent argument that the courts have no jurisdiction over such disputes and that the remedy for stonewalling Congress is, you guessed it, impeachment. They argued that in the federal court in Washington this week. Interestingly, the first assertion of executive privilege was by George Washington when the House sought background documents on the Jay Treaty. Washington rested his refusal to produce those documents on the idea that the House had no jurisdiction over matters of foreign policy. But interestingly, Washington in his message to Congress did specify one instance where the House would have a legitimate claim on the document's release. What was the instance? You guessed it, impeachment. If allowed to stand, this position that the president, any president, can use his or her position to totally obstruct the production of evidence on their, of their own wrongdoing eviscerates the impeachment power entirely. And it compromises the ongoing authority of Congress to provide any meaningful oversight of the executive whatsoever. For these and other reasons, Mr. President, I will vote guilty on both articles of impeachment. Final point, Madam President, the Congress has been committing slow motion institutional suicide for the past 70 years, abdicating its constitutional authorities and responsibilities one by one. The war power effectively in the hands of the President since 1942. Authority over trade with other countries superseded by unilateral presidentially imposed